My name's Adam, and for the last 12 years, I was a cook. When Daria and I moved to Thailand and started this channel, it was just supposed to be about food. That's it. That's all I know. But it turns out that when you follow the stories of food, if you just go where the road takes you, it might change your entire life. This is a story that I still can't believe we're lucky enough to get to tell. One I'm honestly terrified I won't be able to do justice. A story of the forgotten people living in Thailand's northwest jungle. Of migrants and refugees and so-called stateless children. Of perseverance and survival. Triumph and tragedy and, of course, food. <laughs> not, not every day? It's not every day people come to film food video here? This is our road trip to a town called Sanklaburi, an ancient village along the Myanmar border where we came to find the local food, but left with so much more. This is Christmas for me. This is, this is the most exciting thing that could have possibly happened to me this morning. If you've heard of the, the Three Pagodas Pass, the famous uh, border crossing between Thailand and Myanmar, that's where we're headed. There's a lot of stuff on this trip that is gonna take a good deal of uh, research and understanding, and we're kind of going into a situation that none of us really know what to expect. But right now, we only have one priority, which is lunch. This is Highway 323, soon to be replaced by a new expressway, but for now, the road to Kanchanaburi, Thailand's jungle curry capital. We left Bangkok around 9 a.m. in a van on loan from an embassy, invited guests of some mutual friends, and with almost three full days ahead of us, to track down the most interesting food we can find in one of the most unexplored corners of Thailand. Now, the thing about this country is it's a true melting pot. There are said to be around 46 different ethnic groups making up the modern kingdom, and that doesn't even include the foreigners like me. Thai cuisine represents nothing less than history, each dish telling a story, the mixing and blending of cultures and techniques between Siam and the Chinese, Indian, Lao, Malay, even Portuguese. But the farther you get from the urban centers, the more the melting pot hasn't melted. Trying stuff cooked here is like turning back time, a window into a world that used to be a lot less complicated. All right, so the, the guests and guides and hosts for our trip to Northwest Thailand are starting to learn quickly what it's like to travel with OTR. Um, the good and the bad. The good is we eat really, really well. Uh, the bad is uh, we have to sit here and stare at it for a really long time until we're actually ready to start eating because we got to get all of our, our coverage. And then you guys are going to really hate me in a moment because you're going to have to sit here while I try everything one by one and say, wow, this is delicious. Oh. Um, Vasana, JP, and what our driver, who is really upset at me already because he's just slowly started to think, you got to wait, you got to wait. All right, let me introduce you to the people sitting across from me, since they're the reason we're here, two hours into a seven-hour road trip far away from anywhere we've ever been. This is Jean-Pierre, or JP, and he's been in Thailand since before I was born. He's the only one out of six of us who's been anywhere near our destination before. In fact, he's come to the remote borderland several times in his former capacity as Thai director of the Asia Development Bank. And Vasana, originally from Bangkok, once Thailand's trade representative to the United States, for the last two decades focused on public service ever since finding herself in the hospital for two months, injured on 9-11 when the towers fell. This is no normal group. And honestly, it's not a normal road trip. See, where we're going is a place called Sanklaburi, 
almost 400 kilometers northwest of Bangkok and right next to the Burmese border, right in the middle of the most sparsely populated part of the entire country. For a guy into food history, it's the Holy Grail, a place where some of the first ethnic groups to settle Southeast Asia still live, practicing cultures and cooking dishes long lost to the outside world. But it's also a place with such hardship that JP and Vasana are heading there because they're bringing a donation from Bangkok's Rotary Club. School supplies, toys, and money on its way to a school for stateless children. Born into the undocumented tribes in the mountains are here fleeing violence across the border. Sankla Buri is famous for its preserved and ancient way of life, but also for human trafficking, ethnic violence, and most of all, it's wild mystery. There's only one road in and out. Many of the local people are unregistered and Thai's not the primary language or even Burmese. It's the domain of the Karen, native to the nearby mountains or brought here as slaves by the Japanese to build the so-called Death Railway. And most of all, it's the home of the Mon, the ancient people who introduced the region to rice farming, Buddhism, and so much of modern cuisine. Long absorbed into Thailand, outlawed in Myanmar, the majority in Sanklaburi. Somewhere in the middle of the Khao Lam National Park, the signal started fading on our phones. By the time we reached 100 kilometers north of where we had our lunch, the jungle got denser. And for 100 more, we kept on going driving through forests and mountains, through police checkpoints, and finally crossing the River Quay, looking out over a region that all of a sudden was very real. The town was dark when we arrived, nine hours after leaving our home in Bangkok. The next day we'd separate, Jasper, Daria, and I on our food trip, and JP and Vasana off to do their good work on behalf of a Rotary Club. So at a hotel restaurant near the water, we had our dinner and raised a glass to the journey before tomorrow, starting the real one. There's an old story that about a thousand years ago, a monk named Tong Su made a pilgrimage to what's now Myanmar to study under Mon Buddhist teachers. He'd eventually settle here, building a temple in the remote mountains near the River Kuei. Now, Tong Su was known as a healer, and his reputation drew followers, forming a settlement of Mon, Karen, and the ethnic Dai. Today, it's a place known as Sankla Buri. This part of town, this side of the water, is the home of the ethnic Mon. And before we get into anything else, let me talk about the food. As I mentioned earlier, the Mon were the first to bring rice farming to Southeast Asia. Coming from what's now China and the Yangtze River Basin about 5,000 years ago, following the rivers to the south, first settling the Irrawaddy, then the Chao Praia, then everywhere. Now there's not much known about ancient Mon cuisine, and that's why we're here. But there are a few dishes among today's mainstream Thai food that we know trace back to the Mon. There's Khao Kluk Gapi, shrimp paste fried rice, served with an assortment of meats and vegetables and based on a traditional Mon dish. There's Khao Che, rice soaked in chilled jasmine water and associated with Songkran, or the Thai New Year. And most of all, Kanom Jin, Thailand's favorite noodles, served from the far south along the Malay border all the way to the old Lanna Kingdom in the north. Kanom Jin was the signature of the Mon people, in fact, the name, while today meaning Chinese snack, actually derives from a Mon word, Hanom Tin. And it's not unique to Thailand. The noodles themselves are a part of the cuisine all across the region, and wherever they show up, it's an indication that sometime, hundreds or thousands of years ago, there was Mon influence in culture, an ancient trade route or a Mon settlement or civilization long since destroyed or assimilated. In Vietnam, the noodles are called boon, num ban chok in Cambodia, idiapam in South India, in Sri Lanka, and in Myanmar, mohinga.
Uh, so we actually are, we have not arrived at the market yet. That's down the hill and it ends soon. So we need to rush, but uh, the very first thing we saw was a, a, a Burmese lady selling Mohinga by the side of the road and uh, with fresh Kanamjian noodles. So that is extremely exciting. And we are detouring on the way to the market and hopefully we still have time to make it there. But right now I don't really care. Mohinga is the national dish of Myanmar, a soup made from fish stock served with fried garlic, chickpea fritters, and here, condiments including what I think is tamarind, but I don't know because I don't speak mon, and communication might become an issue. That's all right, we can talk through food. I might just sit right here because the other customer just left, and we're gonna chase this with some water. First time I understand why all of our Burmese friends say we have to start every day with a bowl of mohinga. Not to insult the restaurant version of this dish, but it's clearly not made to be a restaurant dish. This is so comforting, um, subtle. I would say a lot less fishy than I expected. Plus, what dish is not made better with uh, crispy fried garlic? This is just very, very good. With breakfast done, our destination was the morning market, open every day from 5 a.m. until about an hour after sunrise. The early morning in Sanklaburi has a feeling all its own. The quiet stillness of the remote mountains punctuated with the sounds of two-stroke engines and people on their way from place to place, with an energy of somewhere both welcoming and incomprehensible. Everyone going out of their way to smile or watch us walk by, a warm start to the day, and also a reminder in case we ever forget that we are very much outsiders. In the thousand years or so since the first settlers followed Tong Su and built a home here in the valley, while the entire world has grown up, the Mon language and culture has more or less remained the same. Although for the people themselves, it's been a long and often tragic journey, and one that needs to be understood to gain any kind of context about where we are. At the time Sankla Buri was established, the Mon were the rulers of what's now Thailand, having built a kingdom called the Devaravati, based in what today is the neighboring province of Supanburi. For this part of the world, this was the first real empire, and it was Mon, establishing trade with China and India and bringing religion from Theravada missionaries. The Devaravati would fall to another Mon kingdom, the Lavo, which would gain even more influence and territory, and the Mon seemed destined to rule Southeast Asia forever. But that's not what would happen. In the 11th century, the Lava would be defeated in a series of battles by the Khmer and would become a sort of vassal empire. The Khmer would absorb Mon language and traditions and people too, enslaving a huge number of the Lava. Then 400 years later, the Khmer would fall to Ayutthaya and the ethnic Dai and the last vestiges of the Mon would disappear. But to the West, the story would be completely different. Far removed from Angkor or Ayutthaya, in what's now Myanmar, the Mon had been locked in an ancient and endless war with their rivals, the Bamar, the rulers of the powerful Pagan kingdom. In the 1200s, just as Thailand's Mon were being crushed by the Khmer, Myanmar's Mon gained the upper hand, establishing their own kingdom. As it relates to our story, where things really developed here in Sankla Buri as a Mon town was when, in the 16th century, that kingdom would fall again to the Bamar, and thousands fled the massacres that followed and came to the remote jungle lands here, around Tong Su's temple. Anyway, long story short, over the border, the clashes continued for another two centuries between the Mon and the Bamar, with the Mon finally routed in 1757, the Burmese army chasing them as far as Ayutthaya and then razing that city to the ground. Now, it's worth mentioning that since the ethnic Mon had long been absorbed and welcomed into Siamese society, many of the nobles in Ayutthaya's court were of Mon descent. 
and as both Toxin, who revived the Siamese Empire in Tonbury, and Rama I, who'd build the palace in Bangkok, both had Mon roots, there was plenty of room for the new refugees to integrate into the new Thai kingdom. Again, though, it was different across the border. The Mon and Bamar had now been at war for almost a thousand years, with the violence persisting until the British arrived and enforced an uneasy peace. They carved out a Mon state, bordering Thailand and ending just across the hills from Sanklaburi. Then the British colony fell. The war began again, and it is very much still ongoing today. And we'll pick up that story later, but first, we've arrived at Sanklaburi's Mon Village Morning Market. This is such a cool atmosphere. I, I, it's really hard to explain how unlike... This reminds me of Yunnan province. It's the only place I've ever been where, you know, you can go deep into the countryside, at least the last time I was there, and you end up finding these, uh, these village markets where everything is, everything is different. The languages are different. The people are dressed differently. One thing, by the way, if you're listening around me, I don't recognize the languages that are being spoken. So from what we understand, Thai, Burmese are both minority languages here. The majority language is Mon. Uh, Karen is a secondary language. So, good morning. So there's a lot, of, a lot of languages being spoken that I have never heard before. Yeah, let's go into the market. We have, we have one hour before this ends. The dog is literally, the dog is literally playing with him and asking for cabbage as treats. That is so funny. This just smells so good. And I just hope somebody comes here to let me eat some of this. Um, Hung Lei is usually made with pork belly. Uh, this looks like beef, but I'm not sure what, what that is or what the difference is. We've got four different types of bowls of stuff here. There's something cooking back there, so somebody's gonna come back to this house and let me eat. Uh, here comes our man. He just went and picked up something. I'm not sure what happened when we followed the smell of food cooking to a platform just behind the morning market. But the long story short is that this is not a restaurant. It's the house of a very confused Mon family, who probably didn't expect their own day to start with Jasper and I barging in trying to order breakfast. Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. There's a section of Sankla Buri intended for visitors a place with at least something of a tourist infrastructure, and we figured this would be a good time for us to maybe go down there to shake off our embarrassment and see the other side of town, and maybe find a place to actually sell us something to eat. The walk from the morning market to the quote tourist center of Sanklaburi is only about 400 meters, maybe five minutes up one hill and down another. But here, for at least a few square blocks, the vibe is completely different. A pretty straightforward cluster of optimistic trinket shops, signs in Thai and even English, and restaurants serving dishes more well known by the general public. We stopped here for a famous place that sells uh, Zhou, in Chinese kanji, or joke in Thai. Uh, this one with what looks like ground pork, crispy garlic, a bunch of ginger, a soft and semi runny egg, and of course, patongo, uh, which is what in Chinese you would call you tiao, uh, Chinese donuts, if you will. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, you should have this with your Zhou, but there's, actually, that's very good. 
I never ordered Joe. I don't know why. You know, because I lived in China for so long, I kind of never saw the point. You know, this is this is what you eat when you don't have enough rice, so you boil it to make it stretch longer. But maybe that's a little unfair. This is delicious. I have work to do. I've got two coffees. The bridge that connects this Mon settlement with the other side of Sankla Buri is the symbol of the region. The biggest man-made wooden bridge in Thailand and at 850 meters, one of the longest on Earth. An attraction that brings at least some curious onlookers to the town, usually after visiting the waterfalls in the Khao Lam National Forest. It's a bit ironic, kind of a metaphor for the region, I guess, that this bridge only gained attention and the village first saw visitors in 2013. Not because of its grandeur, but because it made the national news after being destroyed in a flood, then rebuilt by hand the next year. It's an engineering marvel. Each piece of wood cut from the nearby forest and all of it done by hand. No heavy equipment needed. It's called the Utamanusorn Bridge named in honor of a Mon Buddhist monk named Luang Po Utama. And that brings us back to where we left off, when the British left Myanmar in 1948. We pick up with the Bamar now in control of the newly independent country. For the record, in case you're wondering, yes, the name Burma comes from a word for Bamar, and actually so does Myanmar, both variations of the same term. Anyway, with the Mon state now no longer under any kind of protection, an independence movement took hold and the Burmese sent in the military to shut it down. And by that I mean they pretty much laid waste to the whole region. One of the Mon villages destroyed within a few months of the end of colonization was a place called Yebu, once home to a population of a few thousand, about 40 kilometers northwest of the Thai border at the Three Pagodas Pass. In June 1949, Yebu was burned to the ground, and a local monk, Luang Po Utama, gathered around 60 families and led them through the mountains, avoiding the Burmese patrols and crossing into Thailand where they'd settle their own corner of Sankla Buri. Now to that point, this region was fraught with its own ethnic tensions, with occasional flare-ups between the various different groups. But Utama was a bridge builder, pun very much intended, and the land his followers settled was actually in a village that had previously been majority Karen, a place called Nong Lu, a Karen word meaning roofs made of palm leaves. The Mon areas in Sankla Buri were scattered throughout the valley, and the main town became something of a diverse community, with the new cultural center a temple Utama would build in 1953. Now that's all on the other side of the water, where our hotel is and where today there's something of a small but reasonably developed city. The bridge itself would come decades later, with construction led by Utama himself starting in 1986, connecting Nong Lu to a village on a peninsula that until almost that time was neither a village nor a peninsula. Everything we've told you so far about the history of Sankla Buri, from Tongsu's pilgrimage to the Death Railway and even Utama's new settlement, was based around the River Kuei. It gave life to the region, and all through the centuries as new migrants arrived, they'd settle pieces of land along the river. But in 1979, construction would begin on a hydroelectric power plant, which would dam the river, about 80 kilometers to the south. In 1984, the work would be completed and the ancient valley would begin to fill with water. And within months, a thousand years of history and the homes of countless people would be below the surface. Now, many of the families that lived in the valley were refugees, undocumented migrants and ethnic minorities, and as they lived off the grid, they had no citizenship and thus received no compensation. But thanks to Utama, along with a grant of land from the Thai government, Sankla Buri came together to help build a new village, a home for displaced families who'd once come because they'd already been displaced by any of a dozen wars and conflicts, both recent and very, very long ago. And that is the story of where we've spent this morning, and the people we've encountered in this unique place, keeping alive a culture long lost with their own history just below the water. Wow. 
I've never, I've never seen anything like that before. I had some sand. It's, it's almost surreal in real life, you know what I mean? You can see pictures of it, but when you're actually right next to something where, you know, uh, it's incredible. คือว่าผมเกิดที่นี่เกิดตั้งแต่ก่อนที่น้ําจะสร้างเขื่อนอเกิดปีประมาณ 2,519 ครับที่น้ําท่วมไปที่วัดหลวงพ่อตุมะที่ปัจจุบันในที่อยู่ในน้ําที่เขาสร้างเขื่อนซินิคินเกิดที่นี่พ่อแม่ก็ที่นี่หมดเลยพ่อแม่นะเกิดจากประเทศพื้นบ้านประเทศพมา่าแล้วก็ย้ายถิ่นฐานมามาอยู่ที่นี่พวกผมเกิดที่นี่เรียนหนังสือที่นี่หมดเลยเราใช้เวลาประมาณชั่วโมงครึ่งก่อนที่จะต้องไปเจอกันอีกครั้งกับเจพีและวิสานาที่จะไปเที่ยวต่อไปในพื้นที่ต่างๆของประเทศเราเราถามหมอแมนว่าเขาจะไปกินข้าวที่ไหนถ้าเขาไม่อยู่ในทะเลและเขาส่งเราไปที่ร้านอาหารชาวบ้านที่ใกล้ๆกับโมฮิงกาสถานที่ที่เราเริ่มต้นวันเราทำอะไรที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับที่นี่ครับแกงหมูฮังเลกับแกงไก่ครับฮังเลฮังเลไก่ฮังเลหมูครับคือว่าการทําเนี่ยจะมีเครื่องปรุงมีพวกขมิ้นมีหอมแดงมีขิงมันจะมีซอสดำแล้วก็เครื่องปรุงอะไรอย่างตามรวมกันแล้วก็ค่อยมามาทำเป็น The specialty here is a dish called Hang Le Actually, quite well known in Thailand, and something I listed among my top 10 favorite Thai foods in a video we did last year. It's known in Bangkok as a dish influenced by the Burmese, something that probably came from Myanmar. But this is the first time I've ever known the real roots of Hang Le, a unique specialty not of Myanmar itself, but of the Mon people. If you don't know about Mon, they are the most popular people in Thailand. If you don't know about Thai people, they call them the Mon people. คนพม่าครับคนพม่าปุ๊บตัวนี้ว่าคนอย่างพวกผมเนี่ยคนมอนเนี่ยจะรับไม่ได้ครับจะบอกว่าเป็นคนมอนแต่คนพม่านะคนพม่าคนมอนก็คือคนมอนถ้าจะให้รับว่าเป็นคนพม่านะรับไม่ได้ครับเพราะเชื้อชาติมันมาจากมอนก็คือมอนครับโอ้ my gosh that smells amazing <laughs> crispy pork. Excuse me, crispy pork skin. Everything is better with mukrob. Oh. Crispy pork skin. Everything is better with crispy pork skin. I um, did not expect that in a, in a stewed vegetable dish. This is just the best version I've ever had of this. Time line. Ah, mang mang ngay ra ao mui chot ca ro de mang ngay. เล่นวอนเล่นซีมเล่นวอนวังแกะเสกิดได้เกิดเจริญเติบโตเกิดสอบแชร์กับเราสอบแชร์กับหมูกับพลอยเดินเล็บเดกวานพ่อกุยตาแตดอาเมื่อจอดมาเงยราวสวัสดีครับ Thank you so much โอเคครับ Thank you Now can he tell us what he just said so that we can actually translate that on screen later Okay we just had one of the best meals we have ever had in Thailand the best h u n g l a i curry I've ever had We have 25 minutes before we need to be back on the other side of the lake. Uh, after we cross the bridge, that's where our drive is meeting us because we have plans all afternoon. But I just saw somebody down the road here that's serving uh, onno kao soy, 
And so we're gonna try and fit that in. This is gonna be the fastest food segment we've ever filmed, but we can't come all the way to the Myanmar border and not have a bowl of homemade onokasoi. We gotta run. In 1949, after Utama's successful journey with the 60 Mon families to Sanklaburi, it wasn't long before more refugees would follow. At first, it was family members and neighbors of that first group of modern arrivals, but in 1962, the trickle became a constant flow. That was when Ne Win seized power in Myanmar in a military coup, and in one of his first moves, his government outlawed the Mon language, Mon culture, basically erasing the Mon people. When the refugees would come, many would arrive illegally, but through work, they'd at least earn Thai registration, and according to the law, their children born here would become Thai citizens. But that law would be repealed in 1972, in large part because of just how many people were pouring across the long border from Myanmar. This change didn't just affect the new arrivals, by the way, but also many of the hill tribes in the border regions, who spoke their own languages and lived separated enough from society that they couldn't actually prove that they'd always been here. In 2008, the Thai government reversed the law again, but since then, very few applications for birthright citizenship have actually been accepted. There's a simple truth, which is that the Thai-Burmese border is long. In fact, 2,416 kilometers, about the same as from Paris to Moscow. It's impossible to police, and with so much turmoil on the Myanmar side, there are a lot of undocumented immigrants. When a child is born to refugee parents on this side of the line, the newborn is neither Burmese nor Thai. They're stateless, which means they don't have a passport, but also that they don't receive government medical insurance. They can't buy a smartphone, can't open a bank account, or get a legal driver's license. As of 2023, according to Thailand's Health Security Office, there are 520,000 stateless persons residing in the country. And many of them are here, living a life of survival in places like Sanklaburi. Let's see what we have at a convenience store. <laughs> Can I have just a Coke? Ah, Nam Kang Sai. Pasa Thai. This doesn't even need to be part of the video. I just wanted to, I don't like to come here and not support and buy something. I'll find out. It's about two in the afternoon, and we've been taken by JP and Vasana to ride along with the medical worker from Children of the Forest, the organization supported by the Bangkok Rotary Club, on her rounds as she checks in on some of the makeshift communities built on the outskirts of Sanklaburi. This place, the home of about 125 people, is mixed between Mon, Karen, and Burmese, all living on a remote property owned by a monastery which allows migrants to stay and build their own places to live for a rent of about $5 per year. Delito, the medic, is herself a refugee, first coming into Thailand from a city in Mon State about three hours away. That was almost 24 years ago. Obviously, a lot of people who come here, um, it's not easy. I'm sure when you came, you didn't speak Thai? No. Or did you when, you when you first arrived? Um, I can't speak Thai, okay? I'm really scared. <laughs> I don't have any paper, but it's a lucky one of the Thai men is a, uh, 
take me with his motorbike. We passing to the to the checkpoint. But before is my job is uh, I'm working also the boy on the, the on the what is the hospital like a clinic near the border. So when we take the patient to the Thailand, we have a border pass like a letter you can take. So the the also the people is around there they know as a. I just come and go, so they not check. So I live here. Uh, since of I came and here at the Sanglaburi about six months later, I have a paper, not Thai ID. Na. I have a paper after that, now I have a zero card. There are hundreds of settlements like this throughout the border region, and Delito tries to visit each one once a month. More often, if there is an urgent need for medical service, like here where there's a newborn, from a Mon single mother. Um, this girl, and then she's a, a single mother, and then her job is making broom, but now it's the, this house is not their house. The owner didn't come because of no broom flower here at the moment, so she no job. But uh, since of she have a baby uh, about 10 days, so uh, the, the her mother is people around here contact me. She have a problem, no food, no husband, and then please come and help. So we come and helping her. Now it's her baby dead. Since this land is owned by the Buddhist temple, nobody gets turned away, which means not only is this place known as Frog Stream Village a mixture of languages and cultures, but also of the needs of the people here. For some, it's a temporary stop, a place to stay until the next job comes along in the orchards or rubber plantations. But for many, it's the only option. Among the people staying here are also those who are disabled or look after disabled family. There are single parents, the elderly, people without any other options. In fact, some of the residents living in makeshift housing, close enough to Myanmar to hear the gunfire, have been here for as long as 25 years. Her daughter is have a polio. Polio. Yes. Uh, since I was born, he said about one month, and then get sick and then like that. And but her his wife is a die. Um, when she's a three years old, but now she's a twenty, twenty two. This house, and then. We helping, uh, helping is when the kids sick. And one of the boy is get sick and big, big upset, and then take to the take down to the Ratchaburi hospital. And then this house is we have we also also a pregnant woman around here. So she have my telephone number who have a problem, and then they worry. Yeah, they can't speak Thai or they don't have ID card and then come and contact her. She have my telephone number, she contact me. Just before she said that one of the patients who have a problem with the leg is a calm and no money to go. It's not all despair at Frogstream Village. Many of the children are now students at Delito's school, Children of the Forest, where not only do they learn Thai, but also gain something priceless. A name. A registration, not citizenship, but legal documentation and access to the Thai school system. Hope. For the people living here, there is work. They've formed something of a village business, collecting a special kind of plant which grows in the nearby mountains. This is the making brew. And this is the, the business here, people you uh, yeah, were telling me. Yeah, this is the people in here that, that is the main, the main business is making broom. Okay, and they sell the, where? Uh, the, this broom, there is a broom factory here, and then they, they're making broom here, and then this broom they take to the whole Thailand, Bangkok or everywhere. Really? Yes, yeah. yes, that is all is from here. This is hard work. You see how intense that, I mean, this is thick. This is packed in really thickly. I would stab myself right through the hand if I even tried. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 
I have a feeling in the Mon language, he's hilarious. I just don't understand anything about that. Oh, he said, uh, if if you, you can't buy with the dollar, it might be he said it's a very good good uh, for them. <sighs> <laughs> uh, if you have like it's a, been more than 10 years since I've been back to America. I don't have any dollars. I would love to. So we found we've somehow this still is a food video because even here, even along the Thai Burmese border um, in a refugee village uh, for people who don't have Thai ID, who don't speak Thai for the most part, uh, Man, Karen, and uh, Burmese uh, living here on the, the, the land owned by a Buddhist monastery. We have still found somewhere serving food. And we have our favorite uh, sticky rice flour and what looks like uh, black sesame donut and some squash, which she's giving us with a dipping sauce. As we were about to leave Frogstream Village, I noticed something that caught my eye a restaurant, or more accurately, a snack counter, serving things like fried chicken, sticky rice pastries, and the kind of fritters you'd see in any proper Burmese market. Here, open for business, servicing a refugee camp of 125 people. Okay, no, Ken, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Please, please, please. <laughs> she's, she's feeling a little weird here. I'm sure. Is that what she said? <laughs> not done every day? Is not every day people come to film food video here? <laughs> they're going to be famous for their food. You can tell her this. Is they're going to be famous for their food when they're on, uh, on our OTR. Mm -hmm. It was like the best, best french fries we've ever had. That's a good comparison. <laughs> it was really good. Thank you very much. <laughs> As we left the village to head somewhere else, Delito received a phone call. It was her mother in Myanmar letting her know that she was safe as their home village had been bombed by the Burmese military earlier that same morning. It's a fact of life for her, living here in safety while every day she worries about her family three hours away. Can you go home right now? This is the border. Can, can you go back to visit your family and come back? Myanmar to Thailand or not right now? Not right now. Now is uh, the way is uh, in Thailand you can go, but in Burma they closing the road, so have a wall in there. They closing, so you can't go. Even now my mom hometown is fighting, <laughs> and here is safe. And then if you if you have a uh, like a one day working, you can buy food, right? In Burma, it's no job fighting, no food, no job. So people is uh, just, just... So even with all the, the trouble of coming here with no ID, it's still better than maybe some people safety in, in, in Burma. Safe, safe, safer than Burma because I mean, here is no fighting, right? Even you don't have ID, but only you have to scare when they come and check. You scare them. So if you like living in the jungle, you walking in the rubber garden, that is a safe life. That is what the people fear around here. So this is, if this looks impromptu, it is impromptu. Um, <laughs> yes. I was just telling your father, actually, who's behind uh -huh. us, that my favorite thing about filming is when I don't know what's going on and somebody just says, hey, at this time you need to be here. I'm like, great, that's awesome. It's less work for me. Okay. I've been told now that we needed to be at Children of the Forest at 3.30, which mm -hmm. I don't even have time to process where we are. We'll do that tomorrow morning. Okay, yeah. But we just got here. We changed vehicles. We're in another pickup truck and going right back to the back. Mm -hmm. Where are we going? Okay, so we're moving from, you've just been to some of the villages on the road. Now we're going 
off-road into the jungle, see some uh, rubber plantations quite deep in the jungle, about 15 kilometers into the jungle. And we're gonna visit some of our students that come to the school, give you an idea of just how far our students are uh, prepared to travel just to get an education. And you'll meet some, uh, some mothers and you'll meet some patients as well that we're helping. So it uh, should be an interesting trip. Amazing. Um, and then I see there's a, a cooler being loaded into the back of the into the back of the truck as well. That's right. Yeah, we've got a. Uh, we thought we might as well treat the, the villagers there. Uh, we know them quite well and uh, make it exciting for them. So we're going to. Uh, they're, they're doing a little bit of food and that now, um, enjoying doing that. And we're going to take some ice, take some coke, and some snacks for the kids over there as well. So. Anthony Bourdain once said that the greatest meals you could ever have are the ones you don't go looking for. Instead, life is about putting yourself in a position where they might just happen. Like jumping into the back of a pickup truck heading as deep as the path goes, off-road into the jungle. There was a time, I remember when I was a little kid, when I could be in the back of a truck and just get tossed around and it was no problem. And now every single bump, I'm like, in 10 years, that is gonna murder my back. God, Jasper, yeah. this is gonna make a really bad headline if, uh, if I lose my balance and just crush and crush the kids. That's gonna, that's gonna be really bad for everybody. I love how I, the car is driving so much more gently now that all the kids are in the back. When it was just us, it was like, ah, oh, you guys, ah, you know? <laughs> I hope nobody knows that word. I can't swear around the kids. That was, <laughs> this is why I could never be a teacher. Yeah, I don't know if this is translating to video, but uh, we are, this is just a straight drop off everywhere along the side of the, the bus. It's just a dead drop the whole way. I'm gonna give this back to Jasper because I clearly have no idea how to operate a camera, but yeah. We have been driving alongside a straight drop and there keep being times when they'll yell out to us, hang on tight, this is a slippery part. Well, the car is stuck and we are surrounded by people and I almost forgot that we were, we had a direction and I was just going to keep going and then we're just going to end up as deep as you can get in the jungle and then we're going to turn around and come back and I can't believe that there is a settlement here, but, oh my god! Everyone, see the kids are laughing at me. How about your back? My back? What back? My back is done. There are things that you see and experience once in a lifetime. Places that open your eyes to a world so far removed from anything you've ever encountered that you can't help but leave a different person. This is one of those places. It's a makeshift settlement so far into the jungle that for six months a year during the rainy season, it's completely inaccessible. The only way in or out a four hour hike each way to reach the nearest paved road. A hike that unbelievably, many of the 30 children who call this enclave home make every single day just to get to school, to receive an education and get that life-changing piece of paper documenting their own existence. Our host is Daniel Hobson, born in the UK but in Sanklaburi for two decades, the founder of Children of the Forest, the place the kids here find their hope. Why would somebody build a house here? This isn't just, uh, I, wanna, I wanna be deep in the jungle. This is, are the, are the parents working for the rubber? Are, are, are they independent? Are they working for rubber companies? What, what, where, why does this exist? Uh, yeah, you're right. It's uh, they're the following work, which is typical of all the stateless families really around this area. Wherever the work is, that's where they'll go. They don't have their own land, their own home. So uh, they'll, they'll follow where the work is. And at the moment, the work is here in this huge, rubber plantation which they'll be tapping tonight from about 12 o'clock uh, they'll start tapping and they'll finish maybe seven or eight in the morning so they'll sleep during the day and uh, 
And that's every day or is that uh, seasonal or? Um, in the heavy rain, you can't tap the rubber. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, it's, it's kind of the best time of year. That's when the, the rubber is flowing uh, the best is, is right now. So they'll be tapping it for three nights and then they'll take a break one night. Do you find the kids that you teach or that your, your teachers teach coming from, from a place like this where they have to, I would guess that somebody who would go through the initiative of walking 12 kilometers each direction to get to school every day mm -hmm. uh, is going to not be lax with their work. Is that fair? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a fair statement. It's, yeah, I mean, it's great to see the motivation. Just to get to school it takes them probably about two hours, yeah, to get to school. And then once they're there, yeah, they're going to take that opportunity to study hard. I mean, we've been working with this village now for uh, almost 20 years. So we've actually seen children um, that have studied hard gone through the elementary school, gone on to high school, and are actually now studying in the city to be uh, teachers, community development workers, uh, hotel management, vocational colleges, um, you know, so. And, and what are we looking at real quick, just so we understand, uh, these are all houses around us, or this looks like a platform, which I guess is just for communal meals, or I, I don't know, if you can kind of explain to me just what we see. Is every building going down this way a, a family's home? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, every every building here is is a home. Um, it, there's a community spirit here, even though strictly speaking, it's not a village. It's not a community. It's just workers that are on the land that the the, the landowner of the rubber plantation happens to own. But uh, it's I don't know, there's a, there's a community spirit, and they're all uh, Karen in this area. Um, so these are all these are all Karen family. Yeah, that's right. So it would have started with just what one or two families when they the, and then. They ask their cousins and distant cousins to come and then they kind of build up a village because, uh, like you said, following the work, coming here for the work. The Karen tribe of Thailand's far west are also, like the Mon, an ancient people, with their own history in Southeast Asia dating back at least as far as the 3rd century AD. But unlike the Mon, there is no unifying Karen culture or identity. The Karen are a highland people scattered throughout the mountains of Myanmar and Thailand and as far as the Andaman Islands off the coast of India. And their settlements were built so far apart that in different places they practice vastly different cultures and traditions. But like the Mon, they're also marginalized, and also at war with the Burmese government in a fight for ethnic autonomy. That's the story for the families that live here. Refugees who fled persecution and now get by working the rubber trees in a harsh and unforgiving landscape starting again at the very bottom of society, completely cut off from the conveniences of 21st century urban life simply because of who they are and where they were born. Like everything else here in the settlement, food is usually based around what can be farmed or foraged in the nearby mountains, along with staples like rice purchased with hard-earned income. But today, we're in for a treat. This morning, while we were in the town, Daniel went to his own local market and bought a whole pig, delivering it here a few hours earlier. And since then, a few of the villagers have been hard at work, preparing a true feast, a celebration of life and survival, and to welcome us to their small corner of the jungle with their very best Karen hospitality. So earlier today, uh, some of the guys who we came here with uh, went to the local market and bought uh, some fresh pork, which apparently was just as, as fresh and amazing as it gets. So then they've been cooking all day to prepare this feast for the village tonight. Uh, we have pork curry. Um, this, is, this is rice because obviously it's all going to be based around rice. So pork curry, rice. This is a soup made from the uh, innards of the pork. So we have intestine, we have kidney, we have liver, and then we have the meat from I see hoof and I see spine, uh, along with gourd and vegetables, uh, and that is gonna be hearty and uh, flavorful and very healthy. Um, we have eggplants and we have bees, nuts, and it's gonna be served along with uh, the classic Burmese uh, ngapi yek, the fish paste. And that's what we have, and I think everybody here is about to, they're about to lose it if I don't say, okay, let's open the floodgates and eat, um, because this just smells and looks amazing. This is really a feast prepared for everybody here tonight. The pork curry is just dynamite, yeah.
Mm. Mm. Who, who is the cook? Who do I who do I compliment? Who is the cook? Chef Bing here. I just really want to compliment the chef because the soup is mind blowing how good that is. I just I just is this the chef? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Please please help me to explain that this is everything is really special. This is incredibly good. That I would be proud to serve this at I would be proud to serve this at my restaurant. <laughs> She's embarrassed and walking away. As if we needed one more component for a very, very long and very fascinating day. Uh, we were on the way home to the hotel, and there's a night market, and we the pickup truck stopped, and Daniel said, you know what, this is actually a pretty cool night market, you guys should check it out. So our day is not quite done yet, we have one more stop, and uh, it's the last, the last part of one of the most really, really unbelievably interesting days we've ever had on the channel, and I need caffeine to keep going. So let's start with, a, with an instant coffee. Just a few blocks from our comfortable beds after a day that saw us start at sunrise on the peninsula, explore the Mon village, take a boat trip around the reservoir, eat a bunch of awesome stuff, and then spend the afternoon and evening deep in the mountains. Well, there's still one more stop. And by now, who cares? We can't get any more tired, so we might as well just keep going and do what the locals here in this amazing town do when their hard days are over hang out and enjoy the night market. I am oh, I so tired. I'm wearing a hat. But I'm like, the cowboy the Daria, you, cowboy you, could not, you could not look like more of a tourist. Camera around your, camera around your waist and a stupid hat on. It, it doesn't, at least it doesn't say Ronaldinho. Do you do so, do so come yum. <laughs> Look at this. The crispy fried garlic makes everything better. I did not intend for you to take that spoon from me. I was showing that to you, not giving that to you. Pretty good, yeah? Oh, it's delicious. Mm-hmm. Daria, you and I have traveled off camera to most corners of oh, Thailand. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and there's oh, always yeah. a market like that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, well, <laughs> good, good my happiness. You're a mess with your camera and your your hat and ooh, samosas. <laughs> I've turned into an ATM. My pocket is literally like an ATM now, where just, we walk past a, walk past a food stand and all of a sudden there's just a, a money coming out of my, uh, coming out of my pocket. Okay, thank you. All right, before we get to the last part of this video, I need to go into one final bit of history. In this case, our own, or at least why we got in that van 48 hours ago. It starts of all things with ice hockey, actually a video we filmed back in March about a donut shop at Bangkok's hockey stadium where we interviewed a man named Greg Beatty, who happens to be the president of the local Rotary Club. Rotary, if you don't know, is a service organization. It was founded in 1905 and since then has grown to almost one and a half million members worldwide, with a focus on promoting peace and public works. Anyway, Greg must have been really low on options since he invited me to give a keynote at a Rotary meeting. And after rambling through my speech, I was introduced to a man named Matthew Kelly, a longtime Rotarian and for decades a famous rock musician, most associated with the Grateful Dead. Anyway, fast forward a few months and we're filming in Pattaya and who walks by but Matthew Kelly. He invites us to brunch and tells us on the channel about an organization that along with his wife has become their personal mission, Children of the Forest. The first time he visited was in 2004, right after they welcomed their first students. And that would change his entire life. The Kellys packed their guitars and harmonicas and moved to Thailand and since then, 
have devoted their own resources to the project, including through Matthew's local Rotary Club. When the Kellys first visited Sanklaburi, Children of the Forest was just two small bamboo classrooms set up by an Englishman then in his early 20s named Daniel Hobson. He'd traveled through the region and saw how many kids living on the margins had no hope, no future, no documentation or Thai language skills. So he cleared some land, built a couple of shacks and gathered a few local Mon, Karen, and Burmese and sent them into the jungle to spread word of his new school, where the kids could come and have a chance to learn. The first day they opened, his goal, his secret hope, was for 20 students to show up. They received six times that number. In the two decades that would follow, Children of the Forest has grown into a force for true good. It's a school, a women's shelter, a medical clinic, a self-sustaining farm, and it even has a football team that keeps winning regional championships. Last month, Greg called me again, the hockey guy, and said that two of his Rotary members would be taking the trip to visit the organization. Would we like to jump in, spend a couple of days in Sankla Burry doing whatever we do here on OTR, and maybe, if we want, to check out that place that Matthew and Mary Kelly had told us so much about. And on our last morning, before heading back, well, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, everything that happens today is out of my out of my hands. Uh, okay. You, you know, I think yesterday was was something that me and Daria will remember forever. Uh, and <laughs> it, seriously, and this goes yeah. back to to every part of of sort of unraveling you know, where we are and the people and the challenges. And, and then mm -hmm. obviously uh, that's something that uh, connected with you 20 mm -hmm. years ago because you've been here for, for, for that long. Yeah. Uh, before we get into that story, uh, where are we? Tell me, tell me about what, what, we're, what we're looking at. What is this place? Uh, just, just give me the, the basic rundown of, of where we are. Okay, well, uh, we're in a town called Sanklaburi on the Thai Myanmar border. And this is a special school, school that was established uh, almost 20 years ago now, and a school which particularly caters to the needs of the stateless children. Uh, from as young as four years old, um, the children uh, join our school here. Um, and from the uh, kindergarten, they'll go into our grade one, grade two of elementary school. The elementary school here is a, a satellite of the government school, so the children will get full certificates when they graduate here. And uh, this is uh, their entry point into the, into the school education, Thai education system. So we're, we're kind of the, uh, the bridge between the, the villages, the plantations and the, the big Thai government schools. Children of the Forest sits on about 17 acres of land just outside the main town of Sanklaburi. And here on the property, more than 7,000 stateless children have learned to speak Thai, received an education, two meals a day, and in many cases, legal residents and access to continue their studies in Thailand's public schools. For a stateless child to be in a position of vulnerability where they're um, being exploited or being trafficked, um, the assistance or the response that they get from society is just, just not the same. And of course, there are uh, people um, of influence and power that uh, know how vulnerable and how weak these children are and they're uh, able to exploit that. So that's why um, the first thing we want to make sure is that all the stateless children uh, in this border region are in education. So once they're here at this school, that's when the monitoring begins. You know, that's when we're, um, we're, we're able to know the child, we're able to know their plantation, their village, we're able to know their families um, and they immediately get this, uh, this safety net. Um, and then they also join the Thai education system, which means that they get a student number. There you go, they're visible now, they're not invisible anymore. Um, they, they, they've got some uh, proof that they exist. This is their student number. And their student number is the first step on the way to gaining uh, certain levels of identification, which one day um, can uh, be realized into Thai citizenship. Today, there are more than 200 students enrolled at Children of the Forest, but that's just a fraction of those receiving their services. 
There are houses built on the property for women fleeing abusive relationships or single mothers in need of help raising their children. There's a health clinic operated by Delito, who as we saw yesterday also travels into the villages and looks after hundreds of others in need. There's support provided to children in other jungle schools if this location is inaccessible. And there's even a sports program for local teenagers with the children of the forest football team competing throughout the region. Are you a celebrity to them having come from Manchester? <clears throat> Yeah, some of them think that I used to play for Manchester United, which uh, my football skills are not quite up to that, but uh, yeah, just leave them thinking that. A few years ago, when Daniel's parents retired, his mom and dad came over from the UK and built their own house in Sanklaburi. And ever since, they've dedicated their golden years to children of the forest as well hands-on and contributing whatever they can to a place that every year sees its needs grow, but also its successes. Good morning, <laughs> my name is Faisu. So I, I grew up here. So um, when I, maybe eight years old, I went here, children on the forest. So I studied hard and went to university. And when I graduate, I come to help in here. So we had a little get together with the kids last year and we said, what would you like to add this term? And some of the older kids said, we'd like to have music and play guitar. So we managed to get a, a donation and bought some acoustic guitars, not expensive ones, but just, and the music teacher comes in for an hour. He was here yesterday and he's here again this morning. This is Christmas for me. This is, this is the most exciting thing that could have possibly happened to me this morning. Even if by now we'd completely lost track of the fact that we were here to make a food video, at least someone never forgot. And in between a morning of checking on patients and overseeing the children of the Forest Women's Shelter, our friend Delito found time to make sure we'd fulfill our own mission preparing us a completely unexpected meal of her own family's traditional Mon food. Three-star Michelin restaurant, you know, you have the, the classical guitar playing in the background, we have the music over there, yes. we have the home-cooked meal, it's very elegant, right? Yes. <laughs> What did you make for it? Oh. This is, is more food, Burmese food. Uh, Mon, Mon, very old style, mm -hmm. very old style, true. This is a little bit special for all of you come because uh, in our culture, Mon, Mon culture, when the people come, they, so they will come with the food. So cook food and then eat. If you like, you can try. If you, uh, if you like the taste, you try a lot, okay? If you don't, <laughs> doesn't like, just try a little. Tell me the name of the dish as you would say it in, in Mon language, and then also just kind of a little description. Mon language, no? Anh nhớ anh nhớ học từ ngày nè, anh nhớ học từ ngày vừa cô chị, anh có tiếp bảo rồi, cái son. Okay. Otherwise, I have no idea how to understand. Thank you so much for this. This is just an amazing, amazing meal. Okay. Okay. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy. How do I say? How do I, I know I asked you this yesterday, but I'm <laughs> not very good with languages. How do I say thank you in, in one language? Dangun. 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 Dangun.
if you want to say like a very soft one is a tang kun ra a. Well, uh, after that, yeah, just you said easy is a tang kun. I want to say this in a very not soft way. I want to say this in a very tang kun. <laughs> Not soft ways, it might be not so good. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Until the age of 10 or 11, when they would have come to the school here, mm -hmm. what would life have been like? Uh, their life would have been <clears throat> that of a typical stateless child, really, just uh, the, no home, no land. So you're moving constantly, just following wherever the work is. So you might have a few months here uh, and the work seems good, but then your employer decides not to pay you. So <clears throat> you haven't got enough for food, but you hear about work uh, in another town or another village, and then you'll follow the work there and just keep moving around from factory to rubber plantation to uh, construction site. Uh, yeah, just no, no stability. It's hard in a place like this to put into words what it's actually like to visit. But the main takeaway, at least for the three of us, and I'm sure as well for JP and Vasana, and I suppose for Matthew and Mary Kelly and for Daniel and his family, is that coming here shows how inadequate our knowledge and the usual reporting about refugees and migrants actually is. I mean, the scale of the problem is so big that there's no way to cover this topic without distilling people down to statistics, to reducing everything to numbers. Like the 520,000 stateless people living in Thailand's no man's land, surviving in limbo, with dreams and ambitions, the kinds of things that make us human, long given way to the simple struggle of how to survive another day. 520,000, four and a half million in total who fled from Myanmar, 5 million people stateless, and 35 million refugees if you consider the entire world. It's a massive number, but it becomes completely overwhelming when you consider each one is actually a person. These people, the families who cooked us dinner at the rubber plantation or who stay on the grounds of the temple that allows them at least to exist. It's not fair. How is it fair that I have the life I have just because I was born in New York into a family with a house and a car? Hell, we had two cars. And someone else has to hike four hours twice a day just to get recognized as a person, just for the chance to earn what I take for granted every single day. Food, shelter, clean water. I don't have much. I feel like I don't have much and things haven't always been easy. But even with my problems, I can still go out to dinner or do a weekend at the beach or even have a hobby like playing tennis or running. What a luxury it is to have a hobby. When you think in terms of the top line number, statistics like 520,000 or 35 million, seeing the work that goes on here can feel like taking a cup of water from the ocean. It's too much, it's just way too much. But when you stop turning people into statistics and see each one as an individual, then all this starts to make sense. And what an honor to have been invited here. We're gonna cut down the banana tree stuff to make the kalum gin. When Daniel found out that a food channel was coming to visit children of the forest, he had an idea. Since even though the students come from different backgrounds, at its core, this is a Mon community. We shouldn't leave without at least one last meal of the regional specialty. And for the kids, one chance to show us who they are and where they come from. So the whole time we've been here, while we've been touring the school and having our own incredible experience, groups of students, along with some of the staff who themselves are graduates of the school, have been hard at work preparing us a going away feast. Something for us to remember what it was like to visit Sankla Buri and to spend these last three days experiencing something that we will never forget. Of course, it's Kanam Jean, made with banana leaves cut down from their own plantation, vegetables from their own gardens, and a technique to make the noodles themselves used here in this jungle since the Mon ran the kingdom and everything that would come after, well, it hadn't happened yet. Do you 
you feel fulfilled? Is this a life that you ever would have envisioned for yourself? And, and how, how is, what's it like being you, having, having this life and having seen the success that you, you've been a part of creating? Um, I don't think I ever really consciously planned to, you know, be living here permanently. Um, it's just something happened. I just kind of followed what was inspiring me and what I felt kind of needed to be done and had an incredible team around me to, to make it happen. And I, yeah, I'm happy. A lot of the, the visitors that come here and they think that uh, it involves a huge kind of sacrifice to be here, but not really. It's, uh, it's easy to get up in the morning when you're seeing the, all this uh, inspiration around you. Um, probably more, more sacrifice would be being in an office in the city for me. That would be a real level of sacrifice. <laughs> For more information or to make a donation to Children of the Forest, please visit their website, linked below in the comments and description. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. To everyone who supports us on Patreon, thank you. You make videos like this possible. See below for the link to our Patreon or social media, and we'll see you soon. She's going to take you for a little walk. Is that okay? okay? And don't forget, this is yours. Mm -hmm. This is yours now. Pack up and go back to the house. Yari, in five minutes we'll pick you up. Okay. <laughs> I hope she won't take her to Burma or something like that, but hopefully just for him. Yari, if you leave the premises of the school, call me. <laughs>